wanted to break away to see the world. I longed for excitement, the romance of travel. So we built a boat. And now we travel the oceans. Join us as we voyage to distant shores. Ten years ago, when Cheryl and I were building our boat together back in Canada, we never dreamed we'd sail her across the Atlantic Ocean someday. And now here we are, safely on the other side, with 4,000 ocean miles behind us. Ahead is the Strait of Gibraltar, and for the next few months we'll be exploring countries in Europe and Africa as we sail into the Mediterranean Sea. Wow, here we are in the Strait of Gibraltar. We're leaving the Atlantic Ocean behind and entering the Mediterranean Sea. Our first stop on this lake will be Gibraltar. Then we'll cross the strait to Ceuta to compare this colony on the African shore. Entering the Med, we'll sail along the south coast of Spain and travel inland through the mountains to the remote village of Viardon Pardo for the festival of Corpus Christi. Gibraltar is a busy international port with excellent facilities no matter how you arrive. While Cheryl washes off the salt spray, I check in and meet the staff at Marina Bay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to Marina Bay. Gibraltar has been a British possession since 1713 and is like a little bit of England situated at the southern tip of Spain. It's only six and a half square kilometers, but its location between oceans and continents makes it a desirable stronghold. It's a pretty barren spot, so most of the population live along the shoreline. But there are 300 residents on the Upper Rock who may determine the future of Gibraltar, the Barbary Apes. Legend says that as long as the apes remain, Britain will rule the rock. But what I discover is that the apes rule. They don't bite? He won't bite, Oh my gosh! <laughs> hey, do you know how long it took me to do my hair this morning? <laughs> Oh my gosh, oh his hands are soft. <laughs> They're heavy. Yeah, this is one bigger than the other one. Get down. <laughs> hey bud. Hey. Come away. Come away. Yeah, why don't you go? Away. This will be heavy. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> Inside the Rock of Gibraltar, there are 30 miles of tunnels built by the British military, effectively turning the rock into one huge fortress. Welcome to the tunnels. Thank you. Right in, please. Thank you. Captain Matt Wills shows us around some of this great labyrinth. The tunnels started around about 1779. That was the beginning of the Great Siege, um, and it went on until 1783. Um, it was the Great Siege of the, the Spanish trying to take Gibraltar back, and that's when the military tunneling began, because we had to, so many places we needed to put guns that they dug tunnels in the north face of Gibraltar to place guns to fire down on the Spanish. Um, most of the tunneling was done during the Second World War between 1940 and 1943. Only three years to dig 30 miles, and that was some engineering feat. Um, it's, I find it very, very interesting because it's just the sheer scale of it. If you think today, oh, um, we, we need to build something, well, how much does it cost? Oh, well, I can't make it that big. Let's make it smaller, make it... They came to Gibraltar in the war and they said, let's do something grand. And they, can you imagine being the planner? Let's have a tunnel here, and another one here. Oh, we'll join them off in these different places. We've got 17,000 men, they can do it all. And they did, fantastic, isn't it? Absolutely fantastic. Um, a genuine army second world war tunnel. Uh, it's a French a water boilers, which would probably still work. I mean, they just up stakes and left at the end of the war. And that building would have contained 200 smelly jock soldiers. 
We live in a city whose walls are the walls of the fortress um, built by British soldiers 100 years ago. And we're now in tunnels built by British soldiers, men from my own regiment, from my father's regiment, from my grandfather's regiment. And they were all here, and probably from your family's regiments. They all came through Gibraltar. So it's, it's living in history itself. And it, it's, it's fascinating. It really is fascinating. Well, it's not much of a day for hiking around, so we're going to do a bit of work on the boat. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like I'm diving on the hull since i got to clean off some grass around the water line and also the propeller, I think, is uh, covered in barnacles. So, not my favorite job because it's pretty cold. i got to try and wear this hood, warm up a little bit. Very fashionable, isn't it? Canadian diver's trick. Pour a little bit of hot water into the suit and it'll stop all that cold from rushing in. Brrr. Ah. Ah. Mm. Oh my god. Ah. Thank you for doing this. My next dive is a little more exciting. We hitch up with Jim Field to dive the wreck of the Excellent. Jim's a deep sea diver who's worked for many years on oil rigs in the North Sea. It's a 300 foot freighter, which is basically upside down on the seabed. And we go in through the, through the hole in the hull and swim forward, which is north, through it and come out a hole in the other end. And then you can see what one end will get the propellers, which you'll see they're actually broken up propellers because the um, Navy did some exercises and used them for uh, demolition practice. <laughs> <laughs> this dive is a piece of cake for Jim, who's used to working at depths of over 500 feet. But for sport divers like us, today's wreck dive at 100 feet down is an exciting challenge. The remains of the Excellent have sat here for over 80 years and have seen both world wars. We're not the first to dive here and many of those early divers died in these waters. In the Second World War, Italian divers swam from submarines and from Spain to place limpet bombs in the bottom of anchored ships. The British set up a force to counter this attack and the battle to control the waters of the bay continued throughout the war, divers swimming in water strewn with mines. Are you interested in the cruising lifestyle? Are you planning to sail away on a cruising adventure? Or researching cruising areas and destinations? Distant Shores is a television series about the cruising life with lots of tips for sailors planning to sail away. This is Oswego, New York. We are entering the Erie Canal system and this will take us all the way from Lake Ontario to the Hudson River, which gets us to New York City plus destination information to help you make your cruising plans. Yeah, I can stand on the bottom. We've been filming distant shores for nearly 15 years and know the fun and challenges of the cruising life. We've made distant shores with you in mind. We include plenty of cruising tips in this travel series, as well as lifestyle segments and hints for sailors heading to exotic destinations. Encouragement for you and your crew to get out cruising. Destinations include the Intracoastal Waterway, the Bahamas, Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Scandinavia, transatlantic passage making, the French canals and more. Well, we're leaving Gibraltar. Just loved it here, but we're going to get going and try and make it across the strait to Ceuta, a Spanish enclave on the coast of Africa. Gibraltar and Ceuta are both small strategic territories guarding the strait, but Ceuta is attached to Morocco and is owned by Spain. We want to visit there first before voyaging further into the Med. It's only 15 miles across the strait to Ceuta, but it's a pretty wild trip dodging all the ships. Ferries run frequently from the Spanish mainland to Ceuta, but it's not the shipping that we're feeling worried about. 
I'm excited. I want to see Africa. I've never been there before, but well, I guess I'm a little bit uh, worried about what we'll find when we get there. Uh, different culture and um, you know, getting the boat in through past customs and everything. We'll, we'll see how it all goes. We're leaving Europe behind. You can just barely see the rock in the distance there. And uh, the mountains ahead of Morocco, Africa. Here we come. Like Gibraltar, Ceuta's strategic position at the entrance to the Mediterranean Sea has made the small peninsula a desirable conquest. The Spanish have ruled since 1580, so you feel as if you're in a bustling European city rather than an African outpost. But the architecture reflects the presence of previous occupants. The Portuguese took over from the Moors in 1415, and during their reign built this moat which cut Ceuta off from the African mainland. Well, it looks like I didn't have a lot to worry about coming to Africa. It's pretty luxurious here in Ceuta, the Spanish enclave on the North African coast. But that's fine by me. After yesterday's sail, I'm just going to enjoy it. There's a gale blowing when we plan to leave, so we wait a day for the winds to subside before crossing the strait back to Europe and our next destination, Duquesa, on Spain's Costa del Sol. Voyaging on a sailboat means occasional delays and compromises, but Paul and I enjoy the freedom it gives us to be out in the world, fully experiencing our surroundings. The social life in the Costa del Sol is fabulous. We're only paying $11 a day at the marina, and there's a free barbecue. Come on, let's join the party. Is it possible to die in, in the Costa del Sol? The culinary sampling continues with friends Stuart and Teresa who take us to a local bar to try tapas. Tapas are small appetizers which are served in all bars and cafes and are at the heart of the Spanish social scene. The most traditional tapa and the pride of the region is pata negra, thinly sliced cured ham made from black hoofed pigs. I'm just learnt finding out that this ham has not been cooked. It's just been aged in salt for three years. It's three years old but not been ever cooked. They actually breed these pigs in the fields behind the building here. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they basically round them up and they chase them. And they run so hard, they leak through, they get the head stuck to the wall. Chop I the believe head off, leave the head I stuck there. It. Sometimes they don't kill them, the meat's fresher that way. Just cut off a leg at a time. Mmm. Yeah. Maybe we'll try the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> We met this guy who's an expert in Roman civilization. He thinks he's found the remains of an ancient town called Saipo that's been lost for a thousand years. So we're going out into the hills of Spain to help him search for it. The thing is, it's miles from any real road, so it's good he's got a four-wheel drive. And you see that there's this track that goes there, which is the one we want, and there's this other track, which I reckon is that track that leads down into the valley. So yeah. I reckon it's this track straight ahead. What do you reckon? We're there, we're there. There you go. Not happy with being lost. Chris has asked mine why, so we get completely <laughs> lost. Chris Swan is a historical geographer who uses old maps to trace ancient towns. But in the hills of Spain, it's not that easy to get around. just understood that there are scorpions and dangerous snakes around here. So, off we go. It's hard to imagine that this was a thriving Roman town and now, as you saw, the nearest village is, is uh, you know, an hour's drive away. Where we are now is in the old public area. Behind us is an indent where I reckon the old Roman bath was. 
We'll see if we can find some tiles, more Roman tiles. But... Wow. It's been 2,000 years since the Romans left here. It's unbelievable. They're just out in the hills. They're just ready for anybody to wander around and find in the real Spain. Fantastic! Francesco at the market gave me his very special recipe for paella, so I'm buying the ingredients at the local market. I'm going to make a nice dinner for Paul on the boat tonight. Hola. 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 For a paella. Calamar y calamar. Cuarto de kilo. Uno. Uno. Uh, very pequeño. Tres. Paella is the quintessential Spanish dinner, a traditional mix of vegetables, seafood, and rice. The last thing I have to get is saffron or colorante paella. That's what gives the paella the nice yellow color. It smells wonderful here. Everything at the market is so fresh. I've got all my ingredients assembled for my paella here in the galley. The only thing I haven't done yet is clean the squid. I've never done that before and, well, you probably don't want to watch this. Mmm, smells good. Everything is partially cooked now, the rice, squid, fish, peppers. I've got another 10 minutes till it's done, so now I'm going to add the fresh shellfish. It's ready. Hey, that looks great. And you thought we just ate beans for dinner. We continue along the coast before heading inland through the mountains to the remote village of Villar Lampardo. Everything's perfect. The sun is shining, charging the solar panels, charge the battery, runs the autopilot, gives me a tan, the cost of Del Sol. We get to port, let's rent a car and go exploring. All right. Up into the Sierra Nevadas? Yeah, I'm really curious to see what's out there. Well, we survived that trip up those winding roads, and now we're in the little village of Vier de Parto. They're preparing for a festival, and we're not quite sure what's happening. Nobody here speaks any English at all. We only have a little bit of Spanish, so we'll see how it goes. Bueno, es de que salga la profesión con eso y todo. Bueno, es una maravilla. Fortunately, the local English teacher comes to my rescue, and Lolita becomes our translator for the weekend. There are about 15 streets that are participating, and they're all building an altar or a monument that represents the blood and body of Christ, the wine and bread. <laughs> <laughs> They're saying that the, there's an argument about whether the men or the women are working harder on this or not. Uh -huh. yeah. 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 
Tomorrow morning, before the procession, they're going to cover the streets with all these beautiful flowers. So it's the night before, and the women are working and cutting up the flowers. Hello. You can see here the party has started already. had a couple of hours sleep, but they're doing the flower paintings on the street where they're going to hold the procession, and we really want to see that. So, we're going to get up. Good morning. I'm getting to help here. There's lots of road to be done. The whole town is just entirely covered with, with flowers and with grass and trees and it's just transformed. When everything's ready, the procession begins with mass in the 15th century village church. This is great, what a party, 24 hours. We came out into the hills looking for a little village in the middle of Spain and what we found is a small village with a big heart. Woo wee, lots of wind today. Four six from behind, well from behind, that's great. So we're making almost seven knots, that's our top speed, fast as this boat can go. Sailing in the Mediterranean sure has its challenges, it can be so changeable. One minute, one condition, another minute, the next. And in a way that's just like Spain. We came here expecting all tourist developments and beaches, but we found a land with wonderful culture, a very warm-hearted people, and just a great travel experience.
Are you interested in the cruising lifestyle? Are you planning to sail away on a cruising adventure? Or researching cruising areas and destinations? Distant Shores is a television series about the cruising life with lots of tips for sailors planning to sail away. This is Oswego, New York. We are entering the Erie Canal system and this will take us all the way from Lake Ontario to the Hudson River, which gets us to New York City. Plus destination information to help you make your cruising plans. Yeah, I can stand on the bottom. We've been filming distant shores for nearly 15 years and know the fun and challenges of the cruising life. We've made distant shores with you in mind. We include plenty of cruising tips in this travel series as well as lifestyle segments and hints for sailors heading to exotic destinations. Encouragement for you and your crew to get out cruising. Destinations include the Intracoastal Waterway, the Bahamas, Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Scandinavia, Transatlantic Passage Making, the French Canals and more. <laughs>